This lesson is on shorelines. Shorelines are shaped by waves, tides, and currents that cause erosion and deposition. So it can be said that shorelines are dynamic, meaning that they are constantly being changed by these crashing waves that never stop, the falling and the rising of the tides that never stops, and the ocean currents that are ongoing. All of these cause constant erosion and deposition, which cha can change the shorelines very drastically over time. Chances are you've been to the beach, and you went out onto the beach, and you found yourself a spot, and you put down all your stuff. Maybe you had a cooler, and a beach umbrella, and maybe some chairs, so on and so forth, and you put it all down, you got your spot prepared, and then when you were ready, you went into the water and went swimming. You spend a little bit of time in the water, and after a while, you decide, maybe I should look back and check on my stuff and make sure nobody's messing with it or anything like that. And you look directly back to the shoreline, because you went straight into the water, so it makes sense to look straight back from where you came to see your stuff. <clears throat> and then you don't see your stuff, and you're like, whoa, hold on, where's my stuff? And then you start looking and looking and looking, and then you realize that you have actually drifted on down the shore a little bit. It might not be my much, but it was enough that when you look directly back, you didn't see your stuff that you left on the shore anymore. But you see it, and then you see how far you've drifted down. And the reason why this happens is the longshore current. All right? This is water that approaches the shore at an angle and washes up and down the beach in a zigzag pattern. So when you're in the water and the waves are moving you up and down and you're kind of constantly like jumping up over the waves, this longshore current just carries you on down. And this is what it's more or less doing to beach sand as well. So the water washes up and then when it recedes back it takes sand with it and then it just constantly does this. So it's moving sand down the shore. It's eroding and depositing sand as it goes along. And so every area along this longshore current is uh, losing sand and gaining sand as it goes. It's a ro constant erosion and deposition. And this can change the shoreline over time. And it can also lead to the formation of some of these um, geological features that we're about to talk about. The first one being a spit, which is an outward extension of sand that develops as a result of a longshore current moving sand down a beach. So here we have a shoreline, and for a minute I want you to imagine this part right here wasn't there. So you have a shoreline that kind of does this here. And what happens is as water moves sediments through the longshore current, it starts depositing them and you get this spit that forms right here. It's just this little bar that starts forming across. And I'm gonna go ahead and go to the next slide because you can see a good example here. So this is our spit that's forming across. If a spit continues to form, continues to develop over time, it can eventually form this other feature called a bay mouth bar, which can close off bays or form lagoons. In the case here of this picture, when this spit goes and forms all the way across to form a bay mouth bar, it'll create a lagoon here, kind of like a, a little pond on the shoreline. <clears throat> In this case here, you have kind of a harbor, or it says it's called a lagoon right here because you know it is closed off by a baymouth bar. But just imagine this wasn't closed off. What you had here was a bay that could possibly serve as a harbor or something, but it no longer can serve as a harbor whenever a baymouth bar shuts it off. So this is something that can actually occur to. Uh, harbors and, and bays that ships need to come in and out of and that's what we're going to get to when we start talking about some of our um, structures that we erect to try to control um, erosion and spits and bay mouth bars. But first let's talk about barrier islands. This is an important thing to mention because North Carolina has a series of barrier islands which we call the Outer Banks. So barrier islands are islands that run parallel to the mainland just like Describe with the Outer Banks. If you look at a map of North Carolina and you see the mainland of North Carolina and then you see the Outer Banks, this chain of islands right on the outside of our coast. So there are three ways in which barrier islands can form. The first one is that a longshore current creates a spit 
and then a hurricane breaks the spit off from the mainland. You have a hurricane, you have a storm surge, and it breaks the spit off from the mainland, and you're left with a barrier island. The second way is that wave energy drops sand out in the ocean and forms a sandbar. So you have waves that come crashing in on the shore, and when they recede back to the ocean, they take sediment with them, the sand, and after the wave recedes back to the ocean, it ends up dropping that sand that it picked up. And that sand will just build up in the same spot until you have a sandbar that rises out of the ocean and forms a barrier island. The third way you can get a barrier island is if sea level rises and causes part of the mainland to be separated in island forms. So if you have um, you know, different parts of the mainland that are uh, a little bit higher in elevation, you have some lower elevation places that separate them and then sea level rises and water fills in those lower elevation places, it can cut off parts of land and cause them to be islands. All right, now we're going to talk about some of these structures that us humans build to try to control erosion on shorelines. <clears throat> now, normally, you know, in nature, in areas that are wilderness, it doesn't matter to us that the shoreline's dynamic. You know, we, we, don't, we don't really mind if it changes. But in developed areas like the beaches, the touristy places we like to go to, um, other cities that are on uh, shorelines, you know, humans want to try to control erosion because otherwise we can have some uh, major problems with our development that we've created along the shore. All right, the first structure we'll talk about are jetties. These are walls of concrete or stacked boulders that extend into the ocean on either side of the entrance to a harbor. This is like what I was talking about earlier. Um, a spit can begin to form across the opening of the harbor and it can eventually form a baymouth bar, but even before it forms into a total baymouth bar, the spit can hinder ships from coming in and out of a harbor. And, you know, in areas where you have a harbor and it's used by ships, these are usually important areas for uh, shipping goods, you know, uh, nationwide or internationally. So we, d we don't want our harbors to be closed off. We want to be able to continue to use them. So we erect these jetties, these, these two walls that's supposed to keep the spit from forming a cross. They're designed to prevent spits and baymouth bars. They cause sand though to build up on one side really heavily and heavily erode on the other side. So really instead of totally alleviating the problem, it, it really just kind of creates a different um, sort of problem. It, it's a little more manageable than just letting it go and, and having to deal with uh, the spit that starts to form. But really you get more it's, it's more or less the same problem it's just a little more manageable for us so what happens is you end up like the longshore current is moving this way and and doing this kind of motion like i'm making with the mouse right now so it's picking up sand and moving it down this way and what happens is you have all this sand that accumulates on this side of the jetty but on this other side of the jetty the erosion happens even quicker and not only is the erosion happening quicker, but you're depriving this area right here of sand that would otherwise be deposited there. So what ends up happening is sand will build up on this side until it just starts forming a spit right here on the edge of the jetty. So you end up with the same problem. So what you have to do with these jetties, you have to maintain them. From time to time, you have to make sure you take sand from this side and move it over to this side. And that way you're trying to keep keep it even on both sides like this here. But it's something you have to maintain. It can be expensive and uh, labor intensive to maintain. All right, now let's talk about groins. This is like a jetty, but with just a single wall. And, and there's really no harbor opening involved. You're just trying to keep um, sand from leaving one area of beach like maybe you have like just imagine like Myrtle Beach for instance that most of us know and have been to in our life or, or you know you have a city right there on the shoreline so you wouldn't want your shore eroding away to where the water's coming like right up to your development right up there to, to Ocean Boulevard and all the buildings on it right so this is something if, if, if you were having that kind of problem where your shoreline is eroding away you could try to maintain it and keep it in place you would erect one of these groins just a, a simple wall of, of concrete or boulders that's supposed to trap the sand and you know it, it pretty it's designed to keep the sand from moving down the beach and 
it works as far as you know this one side like in this case in this picture the longshore currents doing this okay so sand is moving down this way so this groin is catching the sand here but again it's going to make erosion happen quicker on this side and it's going to deprive this side from sediments from sand that would normally be deposited here so you get much the same problem that you had with the jetty so you have to maintain these groins otherwise the sand will just like come up around here and then you'll just end up with the same problem that you were trying to fix in the first place so from time to time the sand has to be moved from where it accumulates on this side to where it is not accumulated where you're losing sand on this side so this is a you know a temporary fix at best and something i also want to point out just in general when you erect these kind of structures like jetties and groins, it, it actually, it might help erosion in the area where you erect them, but it's going to make it worse somewhere else down shore. All right, here we have a picture of a groin. You can barely see it here. This is, uh, you know, not been very well maintained. All right, so you have the uh, longshore current kind of going this way in this picture. And what you have, you have this accumulation of sand right here to where the beach, this beach may have only been, you know, to about right here, you know, before the um, groin was erected. But sand is built up and you've got more beach on this side while sand has eroded away here and you have less beach and the water's, you know, you can see a very big difference between where the, the beach ends here and where the beach ends on this side of the groin. So it's time for this one to have some sand moved from this side to this side for sure. All right, we've talked about seawalls before when we talked about um, ways to mitigate tsunami damage. Um, fortunately for us, living on the east coast of uh, North America, we don't really have a big problem at all with tsunamis. It's just not something that we are likely to experience. Um, but we still erect seawalls to try to um, prevent erosion, like I was saying. Like in this picture here, you can't see much of it, but you have like you know a city here on the shore, and you don't want all the shoreline eroding to where it starts affecting, you know, your development. So a seawall is one thing you can erect. Now, um, as I mentioned, when we talked about seawalls in relation to tsunamis. Um, seawalls are kind of problematic. Um, it might protect the land behind the seawall, but it totally destroys the beach because water will hit the seawall and the waves bounce back with most of their original energy and it just makes the erosion of the shoreline so much more detrimental and it'll make it to where you just pretty much don't have a beach anymore in front of your seawall and that's what we saw in the picture that we had for the seawall um, when we were talking about seawalls in relationship to protection from tsunamis all right so i want to move on to this beach nourishment so you can see in this picture here, all right, this is kind of a before and after, but I want to treat this after picture kind of like a before, because I want you to imagine you have this shoreline here, all right, and you want to protect it, so, or you want to protect the development behind the shoreline, so you erect a seawall here, right? And then that process of erosion speeds up because of the seawall. So your beach begins to erode away, so eventually you end up with this kind of scenario here. You have no beach in front of your seawall anymore. So what, um, you know, cities like this that have this kind of thing happen, they have to end up doing what we call beach nourishment, which is where you take that eroded sand from out underwater here, you basically suck it up with a giant vacuum type apparatus, and then you replace the beach, and then you just rebuild it like this. So now you can imagine, like I said, this is like the before picture, and this is the after, but then after beach nourishment, you know, this is your, this is a, another after picture. Okay, so the eroded sand is removed from where it's deposited underwater here and dumped back to where it was eroded from. A lot of times, if you go to the beach and this has taken place, you don't hear the term beach nourishment used. You hear, like, locals who live there will call it dredging. They'll say, oh, well, they're, you know, yeah, you can go to the beach right now, but they're dredging, and you'll usually, like, see some kind of big yellow uh, pipe-looking thing on the beach. And, that, and that's pretty much what they're doing. They're kind of sucking that, that eroded sediment from out from underwater and, and replacing it. Um, I've been to Wilmington when they were doing this before. And uh, 
you know it's it's not the ideal time to go to the beach um, beach nourishment is very expensive and it really only solves the problem temporarily so like in this picture I told you they put the beach sand back uh, but it's going to erode again they're going to end up right back at this position right here again eventually so then they'll have to do beach nourishment again so it's only a temporary fix it's something you have to do and and, and it's it's expensive labor intensive and uh, in some you know in some ways like I said some people don't don't find it an ideal time to go to the beach whenever beach nourishment is taking place so it can it can hurt your uh, you know your draw too for if you're a tourist town and, and and that's I want to to add like all those you know anything that the man-made structures seem to fix in terms of shoreline erosion really they, they'll create an almost equal problem and, and and when you fix it when you take you know from the, the jetties that are growing and move the sand from one place to another or when you do beach nourishment it's only a temporary fix you, you're gonna have to to do it again and again over time all right let's talk about changes in sea level this is something else that can affect shorelines that can that can you know change the um, you know topography um, at the at the shore so sea level has risen and fallen again and again over time. And these rises in sea level are often attributed, attributed to, um, or I should say the, the rises and falls in sea level are attributed to um, whether glaciers are becoming larger or becoming smaller. Okay, so rises in sea level are often attributed to melting glaciers, which we call retreating glaciers. So if you hear the term uh, retreating glaciers, we're talking about glaciers that are growing smaller because they're melting so when glaciers melt that water that once made up glacial ice it ends up you know as runoff and aided by gravity it eventually reaches the oceans and so you know just like I've said before if you had a glass of water and you add water to the glass the water level in the glass rises the oceans no different when when sea, I mean, when um, glacial ice melts and that water runs off in the ocean, it's the same thing. You're adding more water, so sea level rises, and this can cover up shoreline. It can it can basically make the you know the shore be further inland. Now, on the other hand, falling sea level is attributed to advancing glaciers, which is what we we call them advancing when ever you know water is freezing and being added to them. The, the glaciers are growing larger. So what happens in that scenario is that deprives water from reaching the ocean, so sea level eventually falls. And this has happened in cycles, um, you know, over the history of, you know, the geologic history of the Earth. It, it's, it happens naturally. But unfortunately, with man-made global warming, we're contributing to a rise in sea level because the warmer we make the planet by adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, the more glacial melting we have and the more water we have in the our, in our oceans and the higher sea level we have and this can be problematic if if the problem gets too far out of hand you know a lot of our coastal cities could end up under water eventually and it it sounds kind of far fetched but it's it's absolutely a possibility now um another thing that can change um, sea level are tectonic forces, so earthquake activity can cause changes in sea level. Um, when we watched our video on the uh, 2011 earthquake and tsunami in Japan, they explained that um, you know parts of the Japanese coastline was you know thrust upward by about a meter. So you know it, earthquake activity it won't necessarily change sea level globally, but it can change it you know regionally or you know somewhere you, you know close by where the earthquake occurred it can happen you can have uh, pla you can have plates that are thrust upward or 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 moved downward and this can change sea level